Great. Thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, and also, uh, Gary Severson, thank you so much for making this possible. Yeah. Um, Gary, you're really, really welcome. Um, and thank you for sending that email through. Yeah. I've sent around to everybody. There's been some yeah. questions that have come through. Um, so what, uh, what um, we're going to do is, uh, Gary, you want to introduce yourself and talk about your history in the research and who you've worked with. There's some questions that I've emailed you through, which you can take whenever you like, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So um, whenever you're ready, Gary. Okay, makes sense. I was a sophomore in college at Cornell in upstate New York uh, when the assassination happened. Um, I have a very good memory for details, and I, like many people, was troubled as the story unfolded. I think when Ruby shot Oswald, it, it just didn't wash. And I also noticed a changing story about did the assassin munch on chicken while he was waiting and stuff like this, which, which the story kept changing. Was the paraffin test positive or negative? So I was actually very uneasy about the situation, but I wouldn't have done a damn thing except Mark Lane came to speak in the fall of 1964 at, at Cornell. Um, the Warren report had come out about a month or so before and it, uh, he'd been through it, obviously, but many people at this point were relying on a, a, a book the New York Times published uh, called The Witnesses, which looked at the 26 volumes of testimony and hearings, it was later cleared that that was a, a piece of crap and it was interesting what had not been presented there or the version you got. But in any event, um, Mark Lane was very convincing and um, in that same audience, ironically, was Ed Epstein, who went on to do his master's thesis and then eventually a book inquest. Uh, I did not know him at Cornell. He was a master's student. I was in wildlife management. He was studying uh, political science. But his uh, advisor, Andrew Hacker, was the MC that night and actually had Ed to dinner to meet mark and and uh, so anyway and ed was frankly drifting around and didn't have a damn topic for his thesis so he was kind of desperate for any ideas and that's how he came to do it in any event um and when david lifton was at cornell it was two years before me so we i again did not know him there i was to meet him later but to make a long story short i'm from philadelphia originally it made sense once I became interested in the case to contact Vince Salandria because he's in Philadelphia. And every time I went home from college to visit my parents, I could visit with Vince. So I spent a lot of time with Vince. And uh, somehow how Weisberg and I got in contact, probably originally by phone or mail. In those days, obviously, it was phone or mail. And I began uh, doing stuff with, with Harold. Um, uh, and I did a bunch of things. One of them was I went to the National Archives a number of times, usually uh, after conferring with people like Hal Weisberg as to things they wanted me to look for or look at. And, um, uh, you know, among the brilliant ideas that Harold had was look at the general administrative files. Don't go, for, you know, look at the the notes and the memos. Well, it turns out they hadn't been screened carefully and there was a bunch of confidential and otherwise secret material that was in staff notes or memos that were internal and certainly weren't anywhere visible to the general public, but were legally accessible. So we began to discover that's where we found out about the um, fact that, that the commission's first meeting for which there was not a record, <laughs> they met with a Wagoner Carr, the attorney general of Texas, learned that Oswald was an FBI informant and a CIA uh, person even getting his number 110669 for CIA and S172 or 179 for FBI. <laughs> and there were things like that that now that eventually came out when Gerald Ford's book, Portrait of the Assassin, had as its opening chapter, a chapter entitled The Commission Gets His First Shock. And he writes about it. That was not anywhere in the Warren report. But in any event, um, I, I, between Vince and other people, I, I again, was running these shots to the archives. I got to be one of the uh, targeted people at the archives, which meant that only Marion Johnson was allowed to work with you. He's an FBI guy, it says, turned out later. And um, uh, I got a lot of stories about that, but one of part of that led to an incident where either by mistake or purpose, I got a classified document 
that had been misfiled. And I recognized it only because I had memorized all the names in the titles of classified documents. So I, I knew I knew names. And there was Vladimir Boris Karapatsnitsky, hard name to forget. And sure enough, Gary, you're not supposed to mute yourself. You're the speaker. Gary, unmute yourself. Have I been muted this whole time? For the last minute. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Okay. Can uh, everybody else mute themselves because I hear too many background noises. Thank you. Well, in any event, what happened was with this, I, I began to find that you could find incredible things. I mean, I was a gra I was an undergraduate in wildlife management and switched to psychology. I scarcely my area of work, but it, it you get hooked because you're actually finding things that might have some value or meaning. In any event, along the way, um, uh, I I got involved in uh, investigating quite a number of different things. I collaborated with different people. Um, I worked um, when Cyril Wecht went to the National Archives to examine the x-rays and photos. Uh, I was able to get to Washington and uh, David Lifton and I both went with him to the archives. We couldn't be present, but we communicated using an in-house telephone and so at a certain point in time, Cyril, we, Cyril would call us and then we would chat about what he was seeing. I'll never forget the first interaction because he was looking at the x-rays and photos. He said a couple of things. First of all, he said, look, I need a question documents expert. I, I got no way to know if these are real or what the chain of possession was. So he said, first of all, there's a real evidentiary question I'm facing as a forensic pathologist. Number two, he said, there are some of these photos where I can't be sure it's Kennedy because uh, I, I can't see a face. I don't have anything else to go by. He also said that he was pretty angry that the Fisher panel and other groups that examined the stuff seemed to say that certain things were obvious. And he said, for example, the throat wound. He said, if he didn't know there was a wound there, he would have thought it was just a tracheostomy scar. So he said, if you're looking at the photos alone, you're not there in the room, you're not autopsying the body. He said, these things are not obvious actually on the photos. But the, the, the thing that I'll never forget was his description of the head wounds. Now, David had, to his credit, a very smart idea. David had prepared uh, plastic overlays that could be laid on top of the x-rays with grids on them. So you could be able to, you know, make a record of where fragments were and so forth. It was a clever idea because it would be a quick way for him to, in effect, without being able to take a photograph to record what he was seeing. However, <laughs> here's what his reaction was. Cyril said, he said, my God, the head, he said, there are fragments, but he said, the main thing I saw is a haze of very small metallic looking particles. He said, the, the, the head was just filled with what looked like dust-like fragments. And he said he'd never seen anything like it before, but he said that was to him a more striking thing than where, where any fragments were. And uh, this, of course, would be very consistent if Kennedy had been hit with an exploding shell, a mercury fulminate bullet or something of that sort. You could get that, but a normal bullet does not vaporize or end up with small fragments. But I'll never forget it because he, he was absolutely, unex, it was unexpected. No one had described it before. And uh, even the brief description of the uh, head injuries that was in uh, that autopsy report didn't talk about that. In any event, um, I, uh, I got involved somewhat in the Garrison investigation, partly because I had um, a source inside Springfield Medical Center, Federal Medical Center, where at the same time, Abraham Bolden, the Secret Service agent, um, and 
Richard K. Snagel were both present and a guy from Minnesota you may not know of named David Croman, who claimed to know things about the assassination. It's a long, complicated story, but among the other things that was true of uh, David Croman, Croman was down in Dallas shortly afterwards. And when eventually Hal Weisberg opened a link to Paul Rothermill, H.L. Hunt, the oil millionaire's uh, chief of security, he confirmed that this guy Croman from Minnesota had been down there, had been asking questions, and uh, they fingerprinted him. It's sort of like off a TV show. They fingerprinted him off a water glass, gave him a glass of water, <laughs> and then took it in the back and got the prints off it. But um, in any event, I had someone that was working in the prison psychiatrist's office who was also a prisoner, but he was working in the office as a, a volunteer duty who was observing how the men were being treated and also what it was that Abe Bolden really had to say. Because at that time, all we knew is he was a secret service agent who had said the president was not properly protected. And after he offered to come forward, the commission, nobody interviewed him, nobody went to see him. The commission wasn't interested and he ended up uh, getting framed in a counterfeiting scheme uh, by the Secret Service, which was later, uh, the man who accused him actually admitted under oath that he had perjured himself. I mean, but he was in Springfield Medical Center, drugged up pretty heavily and having a pretty rough time of it and had some extraordinary things to say. So anyway, all of these different things were happening. I took some stuff down to Garrison uh, also, and if we have time, we can talk about uh, the stuff I discovered in Martinsburg, Pennsylvania. I, I didn't have much money as an undergraduate, so I had to save up and skip meals to have enough money to afford the gas to make the trip to Martinsburg, Pennsylvania, a small town, to follow up on a lead that I found in volume 25 of the testimony hearings. You know, the last volumes of the 26 volumes are just piles of documents they threw in there. They weren't commission exhibits. It was unclear why they're there. Uh, some of them are, are really quite interesting when you find out the full story and why those particular documents were published, nobody knows except it made it look weighty. You had volume after volume uh, of these miscellaneous documents with no connection to anything, but we can go back to that. But in any event, I had some actual uh, literal evidence that I took to Garrison's office. I got down there and was very troubled, frankly. Um, um, it was hard to engage. His staff were hostile towards me, which I, actually that reassured me because uh, there had been a ton of critics and all kinds of people showing up down there. And the average district attorney's office is into, you know, prosecuting crimes, not dealing with something like this. So this great mash of people from all over the country that were showing up connected to the case, I'm sure just troubled the investigators no end. But uh, what was troubling was that it was kind of chaos. The only person there that knew me by sight was Mark Lane. And Mark didn't even show for the meeting until we we're practically done and came in, looked like he'd been at an all night party, frankly, and was wearing something that I think might have been pajamas, but not, it was close. So I, I mean, I was disheartened. I thought, oh my God, Garrison seems totally fixated, thinks he's got the thing solved uh, and hard to engage him in some of the stuff that, that, that we had. Secondly, um, it was clear that some individuals in the office had a great deal of influence. One was a guy named Bill Boxley or William Wood, who was supposedly former CIA, but was later quite clear he was still doing recruiting on campuses for the CIA after the time he supposedly quit. I'll never forget meeting him. I was sitting at the Fontainebleau Hotel having breakfast with Hal Weisberg and this guy walks up with silvered sunglasses, looked like a character out of a mob movie of some kind, uh, carried money in a clip, no wallet. And all he did was try to find out why I was there. Uh, it was one of those things where endlessly trying to pump for information. Uh, in any event, the stuff I brought down 
including one set of records for which I had taken a major risk personally because they were confidential medical records. I'm in a psychology, a clinical psychologist. Uh, by the time I went down there, I'm in graduate school and I, this was not proper for me to be taking these things. Uh, they all disappeared from the office that night. Uh, by the way, if you Google my name and Tom Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L-L, -L, you will find notes that Bethel, who was uh, some kind of a spy in the office, Bethel, um, who by the way recently died, uh, wrote about my visit there. It, it sounds like an intelligence report. He wasn't present uh, for the meeting itself. I wasn't introduced to him, but he was clearly keeping tabs on what happened. He's the person in the office who eventually gave a bunch of stuff to Clay Shaw's attorneys prior to the trial and, and not only broke his oath, but uh, obviously was up to no good. Um, in any event, that's real quick. Along the way, I wrote a series for the Minneapolis Star and Tribune that ran for a week about the case. I've done a couple, I, I co-authored a piece in the Midlothian Mirror in Texas, Penn Jones's newspaper with Vince Salandria and a fellow named Tom Caton uh, called Watchman Waketh, But in Vain. Uh, and among the things in that, uh, series was a discussion of the messages to Air Force One and the earliest notification at Oswald was to be the lone assassin. Again, I'm glad to talk about that, but we ended up involved with interacting with Pierre Salinger and a number of people to try to get the tapes from the Air Force One uh, messages going back and forth. Uh, so in any event, the third thing I wrote uh, the um, editor and publisher of the Saturday Evening Post, Dr. Corey Servas, was very interested in the case and it had a couple of articles in the Saturday Evening Post, a fairly major magazine in the United States at the time. And she posted a $1 million reward uh, for information leading to solving the case. And shortly afterwards, her niece, who was very close to her, got killed in some kind of a break-in where there was nothing stolen. It was a very unusual crime and the motive was unclear, never solved. And she got freaked out because she had heard about the deaths. And I don't know how it got to me, but somebody was asked who studied the deaths? Is there anybody that knows about that? Well, I had done that. So I got a call from her personally. I'll never forget it because I'm not used to talking to wealthy people who own major magazines. And she, we had a talk and I basically tried to help her with the struggle of the grief, but she asked if I would write a piece on the deaths. So I, uh, <coughs> I put one together. I'm not a professional writer, obviously. Um, the thought would be that anything I would do would have, have to be a professional, really clean it up. And I was talking to Dick Sprague and others who had photos because I was trying to illustrate it with photos of deaths. And the, the article was entitled uh, A Legacy of Fear. It, re, it reappeared on the internet. I, I, it never got published, but it's, it's up on the internet. Um, and it was my attempt to look at the issue of the deaths of witnesses, both the fact that some of these do not appear suspicious and others really do uh, in, in essence. But uh, so that's, that's sort of the big picture along the way. Uh, we had some exciting events in Minneapolis. We had a, um, a position open in our research unit, which was doing studies on uh, the polygraph and on uh, these kinds of measures. And uh, we had a, a, one of our researchers left town suddenly. And so we had to hire a replacement and a guy came in with really good credentials, all kinds of letters of reference and stuff, but probably probably a month into the job, it was relatively clear that he, whatever he was, he wasn't what he was supposed to be. And one of my roommates accidentally at 2 a.m. found him rifling my desk. And he was asking a lot of people about uh, the Kennedy stuff. And so every talk I gave, he showed up. And then he was asking people, he heard I was going to New Orleans and he was asking about what Rowley was taking and stuff. It was pretty eerie and weird. 
So uh, we thought fair is fair. So one night with guards, <laughs> we went in and dismantled his desk from the back and got his resume out. Well, it turned out the guy's a geologist. He had spent time in Haiti. He'd spent time and he was military intelligence, top secret security clearance, um, and had been stationed in a number of places. And we later were able to find that the letters of reference were, were faked. People had done it as favors to various people. We never really discerned the whole thing. But um, I, I actually met with him privately and said, that you know the military intelligence thing was of some interest because when they closed off attempted to close off the depository one of the people they nabbed inside was James W Powell an army intelligence man who had apparently taken photos of the assassination neither he nor those photos have ever been seen uh he's not interviewed by anybody on the record other than simply verifying who he was and um so, you know, I revealed to Jim that we knew he had been Army intelligence, at least up till fairly recently, and also that he obviously wasn't really a, psycho a researcher. And um, he, it was interesting because he was a, he, somebody really liked Kennedy. Um, and it, it spontaneously said things about that. So I just said, you know, there are well-intentioned people that are accessories after the fact in this thing. And I said, you know, and I threw out the James Powell thing. And he, he said, you know, I've appreciated the fact you guys have been real nice. He was coming to us for advice on girls he was dating. I mean, it was sort of like we had kind of adopted him in a funny kind of way. And he thanked us for that, especially given the fact that we had found out that he was not there on legitimate purpose. And he apologized for that and just said, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not able to tell you anything more, but there is something I'd like to do to help you, but it, you've got to promise that it can't be known. So we set up a mail drop uh, and the implication was it had something to do with James Powell. Anyway, what happened was uh, I was gone for about a week and I came back and there was no Jim Murray. He was gone from the office. I said, where's Jim? And she said, well, he just left for Alaska. I said, Alaska? She said, yeah, he abruptly, he got a call. He was getting calls from somebody in Alaska, Mr. McGregor of McGregor Joint Venture. The guy eventually had to leave a number. And next thing you know, he was packing up the stuff, said he had to go there for a job, apologized for leaving us in the lurch with the research project and put his car in storage and took off. Well, I, I, was, I was flabbergasted, didn't know what to make of it. Um, and then a week later, I got a phone call from a man purporting to be a police officer in Anchorage, Alaska, saying he'd been shot to death and that my name and number were in his pocket. Um, and at first I didn't believe it, you know, and, but it turned out there were, there were media accounts, he was dead, different versions of how he was killed, but supposedly he was out in the outback somewhere and got shot and they couldn't get him to a hospital fast enough and he bled to death. Um, we tracked down his uncle who had raised him in a small town called Corcoran, California, who again confirmed he was dead. There was a memorial service here for him. Uh, I'll be frank, that freaked the hell out of me. And uh, that that was part of the reason eventually I got very inactive in the case. It just, it was, a, it was a bit much. I'm saying I'm a graduate student, what the hell is going on here? But um, so my, my work on the case was predominantly in the early days, but I got reinvolved a bit with uh, the house committee. I provided them with some materials and stuff. Other than that, unlike probably any of you, I have not followed most of the discussion on the web. I have not kept up. People contact me because as Harold Weiss, after Harold Weisberg's death, his papers are in a university library. As our researchers find things, I get contacted all the time now about some letter I wrote in 1969 or something else. So I've been engaged periodically in all kinds of discussions uh, just because of that. But all of my 
presenting work and real heavy involvement in the case pretty well ended by the mid 70s. So I'm, I'm sort of a time warp. But over the last three years or so, I've been part of a group of uh, sort of Vince Salandry and a bunch of older folks who were involved in this case years ago. I had an email discussion group fairly regularly. And so <clears throat> I found myself revisiting all kinds of uh, stuff. But let me, let me do this. Let me answer the questions that were sent. And then I, I and please interrupt if there's something. Uh, Thanks, Gary. Uh, the, uh, you said, you. Uh, this is Stuart Galloway. I, I, I note from Gary's notes that he knows David Lifton and Cyril Wecht and has been to the National Archives to study the x-rays and, and photos uh, uh, and uh, talked about Lifton's book where he talks about the body being uh, altered on the plane and different bodies arriving and so forth. Um, I basically don't buy that, to tell you the truth. Um, first of all, David for years kept saying he had this great gem he had discovered that's right there in the public record that alters the case. And it turned out it was the simple statement that it looked like there'd been surgery on Kennedy's head. Well, I don't think that means a tin of shit. The reason is because we know there was massive damage that was seen from the beginning. We also know that, a, that the scalp was not torn off. It, it was in an enormous flap of skin and hair and it flopped back down. So you could look at him and not see the massive wound because it had been blown back, but it blew back down. I, I, the, what that statement was referring to was simply the fact that damage was massive and it was a shock. Even, even to people who had not autopsied gunshot wounds such as Humes and Boswell who conducted the autopsy, but even Fink, who was the one qualified man present, I'm sure he'd never seen any damage of that magnitude. That's a, I mean, part of his head was blown off. Got to remember that the bone that was found the next day, the Harper, so-called Harper fragment, was the juncture of the occipital and parietals, sort of right in the middle of the skull. I mean, it was just blown 50 feet away into the grass. And remember that the motorcycle officers uh, that were to the left and rear got splattered with blood on the right, right sides of their wind, windscreens. There's no question that, that chunks of brain and stuff were blown off. Uh, when they got the body, um, I see no reason to believe that the head had been altered in any way. The point is he was hit at very least once in the head with an exploding shell of some kind. Uh, the, I had believed there were two head hits and how I got linked up with Tink Thompson before Six Seconds in Dallas was originally Cyril was not working on the case. And although all I was was a graduate student in, in, in the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry, I had looked over the autopsy you know, what purported to be autopsy notes. And I had actually submitted them without, without any, anything revealing it was Kennedy to the chief medical examiner of Minneapolis, who was actually a nationally known forensic pathologist. He at first did not believe it was a real autopsy. And then he suggested that it sounded like there might be two patterns that there might have uh, So Vince Salandria knew that Tink Thompson also believed that this is when none of that was out public and he hooked us up. So originally I was doing an appendix for him. When Cyril came along, I said, well, for God's sake, you know, he's, he's actually qualified. You, you know, if you can get someone of that caliber, that's wonderful. But um, I, don't, I don't believe that there's any evidence that's incontrovertible that the head was altered in some way. And secondly, as I said to David, it makes no sense. Why would you do something like that? At this point, you have an autopsy that's going to be conducted under very secure conditions. In fact, you were able to change the findings from what the FBI agents observed to what was originally printed. 
uh, the original nodes get destroyed. I mean, why would you why would you need to alter it? Secondly, you'd have to you'd have to know that there was something wrong with the picture. And I, I just do not believe that that afternoon, remember Air Force One left Dallas um, by two o'clock. So uh, it's inconceivable to me that somebody would have set that up. By the way, the risk of doing anything to the body and being caught at it would be substantial. Now, uh, can we know that there wasn't some kind of screw up in the transportation? I don't know. The one thing David has that was very convincing as I've seen his tapes of his interviews with the people that talked about the body bags and other things. And I, I have to admit those people were persuasive, but I have to go back to the fact it doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. And it would have been, it, it just makes no sense at all. And I just can't imagine uh, people who plan something like this would do anything that stupid, frankly, totally unnecessary. And again, I got to go back to the fact that uh, whatever happened, uh, the key issue is what happened in that autopsy room and what didn't happen. And the fact you had a, a gang of generals watching the thing and an army general giving direction in a Naval Medical Center with three admirals present, including the head of the medical center and the army general apparently was not a physician. And Lieutenant Colonel Fink still can't remember his name, <laughs> but that's who told him not to probe the wounds and not to actually conduct a full forensic autopsy. So that to me is the main issue. It's not fiddling with the body. Um, I, I think, you know, so, that's, that's how I explain it. I, I just think, however, those people uh, saw what they saw or believe what they saw, I still am not convinced that there was any kind of shifting of bodies. It makes no sense that you would do it. You would need to do it. Incredible risk taking to do it. And um, I, I can't explain, however, what those, those people testify to. I mean, I, um, all I can say is that David's interviews with them are, are, are quite convincing. I, I had no problem with that, but uh, that's not sufficient to convince me that's what happened. Um, first of all, before I jump to the next thing, does anybody have a follow-up questions on any of that before I jump to well, these other you questions? Thank you so much for that, Gary. Um, just one further thing, the actual receipt of the body, I mean, there were quite a few people who witnessed um, possibly a body being received and then another body being received later on. There was the causeman who had been asked to take x-rays, I believe, and yet he saw Jackie Kennedy coming in for the first time into Bethesda. It, the Carol be, Costa. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, there seemed to be quite a time lag. Why would they worry about the delivery of the body unless there was something that they wanted to cover up? Well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I, I don't know what they would, what they would cover up. Uh, the head was blown off. That we know from the beginning. So I'm not sure that was the thing that uh, David got stuck on. I said, look, what do, what do you think? Is it just that they enlarged the wound? And that doesn't make any sense. There's an enormous wound. So that it, it was partly that I couldn't understand what it would accomplish. No question though, there are some discrepancies. There are some things that are weird in terms of what those people recount. And I don't know what to do with all that. So I'm not discarding it. I, it yeah troubles me but I do think that the um, it, it it's hard for me to conceive of why in this particular case you would alter the body and what what would you alter about it I mean you know for you know it, it even even you know why not put a different back wound in or something <laughs> I don't know you know it, it just is very hard for me to conceptualize a meaningful impact on the case or its investigation of altering that body. Uh, altering the x-rays, photos, I'm quite open to any of that stuff. Uh, and 
but I, I, I have trouble with the body thing. But I agree with you, that stuff is convincing. It's troubling. I don't discard it. I just don't know what to do with it. Uh, but it's not sufficient for me to buy into the bigger theory um, that, that that was going on. The, the uh, other piece that's interesting here is that originally the body was supposed to go to Walter Reed and went instead to Bethesda. And there's things we still don't know about. Why was that? Um, Kennedy was a Navy man, but Walter Reed would be a more typical place for that kind of evaluation to be done. And of course, they brought in uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fink, was, who was Army pathologist, because uh, the Navy pathologists were both hospital pathologists. They weren't forensic pathologists. So, mm -hmm. But I, I can't tie all that together, and I can't explain it. Absolutely not. It's one of those things. Eventually, I step back from it and say, okay, this doesn't fit together. It doesn't make sense. I'm not, I'm not going to think about it any further because I really did see some of those interviews on tape that David had when he was in Minneapolis. He showed me, and I, I thought they were very convincing. <laughs> it's just the big picture that derived from it didn't make any sense to me. So, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, could you go back? What was in uh, Martinsburg, Pennsylvania that you referenced? Yeah, Martinsburg. Uh, well, let, let, uh, and I'll go into that, but let me just make sure. Any other questions about this whole, the autopsy stuff? Uh, there's been a couple of questions in the chat area, uh, Gary. I'm not sure whether you can see them, um, but there was a question. Um, just uh, Doug Horn is, uh, sorry, this is from David. Uh, Doug Horn has argued that before the, that the surgery was done by Humes at Bethesda before the autopsy to hide evidence of a shot in the back, from the front, sorry, from the front, not the back. Um, and then he's talked about a black ambulance arrived before a gray one arrived. There's a cheap shipping crate, which again has, been, has come, across, come up. Um, Ryan has mentioned that um, it's a contrast between those observations of the personnel at Beheshta versus the observations of personnel at Parkland, where um, Ryan always thought that Lifton's research raises questions, even if it doesn't buy his theory. Well, I think it raises questions, but I, I have, I do believe that the extent of the, the wound to the head was seen by doctors at Parkland. Only some of them didn't notice it because the flap of the skin was down. But when yeah. you look at, I mean, uh, and it's hard to visualize, but the scalp with the hair on it and stuff is firm enough that if it falls back over, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be dreaming that the skull's been blown away. Obviously, uh, that bone that was found so far away the next day uh, wasn't cut out by Humes in Bethesda. That was already gone. Uh, it was a fairly good sized chunk of skull, by the way. Uh, and we know there was debris on the back of the car from Kennedy's. We don't know what, you know, there's stuff that was not recovered. But I, I see, I don't see a big discrepancy between the observations at Parkland and what was seen in, um, in Bethesda. I just don't. Okay. Yeah, um, thanks, I've, got, I've got a question. Um, this is with regards to the autopsy photographs. Um, obviously, the only photographs that are available are the ones that came from the uh, Secret Service agent that uh, of which Mark Crouch uh, got a set from, which I think was somewhere in the 80s. Uh, it's a set of six pictures. Um, I happened to come across a document, which is quite a bombshell, which is uh, Jackie Hess, which I think is from the HSCA, who went to NPC Photo Lab with prints of three rolls of film, which included autopsy photos and x-rays. And this is a 30 page document. And um, each, and then before you say, I want that, before any one of you says, I want that document, it'll come out in due course. But um, this document in, describes in detail every aspect of JFK's body and frame number and roll number of three rolls of 35 millimeter film. 
and Jackie Hess basically took the prints with her and she went to NPC labs and had copies made of these films. And she wrote such a detailed report. She basically followed every move of the lab technicians uh, uh, taking these photographs as such. My question is more not about the authenticity of the six photos that are publicly available. It is more about <clears throat> how can this stuff all stay hidden and how, what is your take on, is it just the Kennedy family that basically makes sure that the brain disappears and that the photos in general are just staying offline and not coming out at all? Because what I read in this document is that there are seven sets of each print made. So that's, that's talking, we're talking about 700 prints are basically in, in drawers and, 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 and wherever, in envelopes and so forth, yet not one of them has actually come out as such. And I believe this report because it's, it's so detailed, it's, it's just not funny anymore um, how, how vigilant this woman is basically by taking these photographs from the archives to NPC and then come back and basically deliver this report as such. And I just wanted to know what your takes regarding the well, first of all, uh, one of the my takes is that this is a good example of some of the remarkable work still going on that people this far, this much, much later are still coming up with things that are meaningful. That was what hooked me on the case at the beginning. You could actually find things that were meaningful. As far as why they're not coming out, it used to be there were various theories thrown out. One was the Kennedy family had something to do with it. Would the Kennedy family not want a shot of his face or something shown? Yes. Was there a concern about medical knowledge? Yes, about his Addison's disease and other things, although eventually all that stuff became very public anyway. But none of that really has to do with autopsy photos. You don't, you don't see Addison's disease in an x-ray or photograph. So I do not buy the idea that the Kennedy family has anything to do with that, to tell you the truth. I might add that Bobby Kennedy himself got killed. The family's ability to influence anything nationally went down to just about zero by 1968, given. Uh, so I, I think as a practical matter, um, there are different layers of cover-up. There's cover-up connected with the actual killing. There's cover-up connected with not wanting people to think that there was a conspiracy or anything of that sort. And then there are federal agencies and agents who are covering up their own misdeeds and mistakes and screw ups. And one of the things I learned early in the case was what makes it so complicated is everybody's running to cover their ass. I mean, Oswald was an incredibly good patsy to pick because you can connect him to everybody. You can connect them to Russia, Mexico, Cuba, uh, right wing, left wing. I don't believe, you know, I, I believe he was a, a, a low level CIA and low level FBI uh, person. But the point is that everybody ran for cover. The CIA burned up his files in a Thermofax machine in Washington the day of the assassination. I mean, it's everybody's running for cover. And I do believe that we know now that Earl Warren, with tears in his eyes, who absolutely did not want that job of heading the commission, was told by LBJ that the peace in the world was at stake. And in fact, there was a danger of, of you know, nuclear war or something of that sort. And, and there was a lot riding on this. So um, because a trail was left to implicate Russia, Cuba um, didn't work, but it was left. And it, so to make a long story short on that one, I, I do believe that um, uh, there it's a complicated thing depending on which piece of evidence as to who's doing the cover up and why. But I think there is a great deal of cover up that has to do with the actual killing itself. There are other cover up that has to do with agency misconduct. It's a little bit like what's going to happen when you're going to look at the uh, the invasion of the U.S. Capitol on the. 6th of January, the layers of involvement of different people for different reasons uh, make it, there are a whole lot of stories to be told beyond just Proud Boys or any si single group. And I think that's true here too. 
But I do believe that the control of information about Kennedy's body in the autopsy was critical from the very beginning. Got to remember, when do you have an autopsy where you got a bunch of generals in the room giving orders? You know, even the autopsy of Stalin had outside observers. And you folks may not realize this, but Nixon's or um, Abraham Lincoln's body had to be exhumed because of fucking up in the autopsy. So to not have an autopsy supervised by competent civilian experts and witnessed here instead, we have Cybert and O'Neill, two FBI agents who come out with a different version of what was found from what eventually ends up. So they had problems from the very beginning with information about the body and the shots and everything else. And I think this is all part and parcel of that. Uh, there are also things we don't know about the case and there may be things being covered up that we don't understand because we don't know the full story anyway. And, that, and again, in involvement of which people at what time. Just think, look at the autopsy itself and, and what we don't know about it and the fact that comprehensive pictures of it with all the players being interviewed at the same time just aren't there. We got bits and pieces of descriptions. So thank you. Uh, the, the Martinsburg, Pennsylvania thing was my first personal investigation. It didn't involve archives. I was working my way through the 26 volumes. I well, again, I <laughs> I skipped some meals to have the money. The report in the 26 volumes in, in that year cost $50. And for me, that was a lot of money. But I saved up and bought my set and they came and I started through them and I encountered tons of surprises, but I then started wandering through the last six volumes. And um, when you're dealing with these miscellaneous documents and the more I read, the more I thought, what the hell, is, why are all these documents here? And it looked like a grab bag. Somebody just grabbed a bunch of stuff and put it, put photographs. I came upon one from Pennsylvania. So I'm interested, it's Pennsylvania. What's Pennsylvania got to do with a Dallas killing? And here's the story. A man contacted the Altoona office of the FBI and said that his sister had found a piece of paper with Os the names Oswald, Ruby, Rubenstein, which is Ruby's real surname, uh, Dallas, Texas, a six digit number and the words silver slipper. And she had found this before the assassination, the week before. And the only reason, and, and she just suddenly realized Ruby shot Oswald and suddenly freaked out, told family members, showed her daughter the thing. And so her brother said, well, we've got to bring this to the FBI. Called the Altoona office of the FBI. According to the FBI reports, they had come and interviewed her. Their version, reading their version, they were beating up on her. In fact, at one point she said, well, if you don't believe me, let me give me a lie detector. <laughs> now the FBI is really a jitter who loved the lie detector test. They refused to give her a lie detector test. And then they dismissed her allegations with um, a, um, uh, a statement that her son-in-law said she's unreliable. Well, it turns out that once you get to know the, the, the FBI investigation part of this, you realize that when they want to get rid of somebody, they find a relative that doesn't like them who will say they're unreliable. There's no specifics about unreliable how. Here's the deal. Um, so they, they, they dropped it there. Obviously, the Warren Commission never looked at it. Uh, I thought, my God. Now, here's the other kicker. She thought that this piece of paper she picked up in her yard was from some partially unburned trash that the wind had blown out before they burned. The trash burning was being done by a Cuban family who had come to town with the father teaching Spanish at the high school. No one in that town had ever seen a Cuban. And um, that the, uh, they were actually in her home renting she and her husband were separated. She was living in a room over the garage. Um, so I read this thing. And I thought, wow. First of all, they didn't 
really try to get the information. When she couldn't produce the piece of paper while they were there, she produced stuff, they didn't produce that, they went away. And I thought, this is unreal. So I saved up my money, got the gas, <laughs> drove all the way across that part of Pennsylvania. And I got to her front door, summer. I wore my only suit and I had my little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder here. <laughs> and I, I, I said that I was a researcher. I was just trying to follow up on that. And she said, how do I know you're not a communist? Well, how the hell do you prove you're not a communist? <laughs> I, had, I, I freaked. And fortunately, I kept my wits about me. And I said, well, uh, you know, look, I, I could show you my ID and stuff, but I wouldn't prove I'm not a communist. I'm just a college student. I'm doing research. Uh, but um, maybe you could help me with this thing. I'm wondering if these things your son-in-law said about you are really true. <laughs> well, she lit up. <laughs> well, maybe you should come in for some tea. I then showed her all the documents from the, the uh, 26 volumes and I had gone to the archives and gotten the original. So I had good clean copies and she read them. And I said, it looks to me like you felt pressure. She said, she said, I couldn't believe it. She said, I'm American citizen, patriotic. I, I, I was trying to do the right thing and my brother got to do it and, and I got treated like a criminal. I said, well, that's interesting because the FBI version makes it sound like that's what they did. She said, I didn't know why that was. Um, and they were not interested in me finding it when I couldn't find it when they were here. So she said, I got scared and I got worried and I, but I mostly got confused. And Mrs. Hoover then said, but you know, I'm kind of a pack rat and I keep a lot of stuff. So I started looking around for stuff and I found a whole bunch of other stuff that might be relevant. And I sent it to Senator Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania, my Senator. And sure enough, she had a thank you note I contacted Senator Scott and he said, yes, we received a whole batch of materials from her and we had sent them right to the FBI. I said, well, Senator Scott, you might be interested to know that they're not anywhere in the Warren Commission records. The FBI's full investigation of the case doesn't include any reference to her um, other than those reports. There's no follow-up, there's no anything else. And um, so here's what she had. Oh, and by the way, the Cuban family wasn't just they were Cuban. Uh, from high-ranking high people in the Batista government, all kinds of connections. But here's what I learned from Mrs. Hoover in, in the town. First of all, the reason that she kept the piece of paper was she and her husband was separated and she thought he had a woman on the side. And she saw the name Ruby, which is why she picked it up, thinking it was a woman's name. That was the whole thing. So first of all, she, there was a good explanation for why she was interested and why she kept it. Uh, the second thing was that she only remembered it when Ruby shot Oswald and she saw it on TV and said, oh my God, that name. Now, uh, she then paved the way for me to interview people in the town. Here's what else I learned. First of all, the day of the assassination, nobody in that family showed up for work or school and they weren't seen for a week. Secondly, given that they're in this very small town of busybodies, keeping an eye on these Cubans who were seemed pretty strange to members of the town people, people had observed the following. They had Cubans come to visit. They had a group of people in some kind of party and they were using a picture of Kennedy as a dartboard, throwing darts at it. Um, Secondly, when the family finally reappeared in public, the wife was always wearing a scarf around her neck and people thought that was really weird. Um, and late, there had been Cuban groups coming to visit and sometimes there were enough that some of them had to stay in the local hotel. So I got the hotel keeper to let me see the register and she suddenly realized that the Cubans had never signed in. She just hadn't paid attention. She said, you know, the register is one of those things I don't really pay attention to. But she, when she went back, she identified the dates and stuff. And then she looked through the whole register. She said, no, I, she said, I don't know who those people were. They only stayed for a night. At some point after the assassination, a large group of Cubans came at night and were observed by townspeople and Mrs. Hoover taking lots of boxes out of the house. Then 
without any prior warning, about a month later, the family suddenly left town. The husband left his job and they, they just left town, gone. Uh, so obviously, if you had anything with Ruby and Oswald's name prior to the assassination, you've got foreknowledge, you've got conspiracy. And uh, what's come of that? Well, obviously, uh, I eventually turned it over to the House Committee and Gato Fonzi did run down Julio Cesar Fernandez Jr. The, there are two, by the way, two Julio Cesar Fernandez is in the case, but he ran the right one down in upstate New York and said he really didn't get anything out of it. Uh, obviously, the committee was not in a position to do a, a real investigation like the FBI would be. Uh, so we still don't know um, what it was, how they would have had this information. Now, the other thing that Mrs. Hoover found were used plane tickets to Las Vegas and tickets to a club called the Silver Slipper in Las Vegas. Now these, and I would tell you, this guy's not a gambler. So um, the Silver Slipper, we thought at first was a nightclub that, that Ruby owned in Louisiana, but there are Silver Slippers elsewhere. The Silver Slipper in Vegas emerged during an investigation of the Howard Hughes CIA ties and some of the Cuban ties as a place where the money was laundered. So again, that doesn't prove anything, but you can see this is a, was a lead that, that should have been followed up. And one of the things I've always looked for is information people had before the fact about any of the parties. Uh, so I got involved in the murder of Rose Sharami in Louisiana, uh, J. Garrett Underhill, others who had made comments prior to the assassination or immediately afterwards that appeared to have some kind of special knowledge. That's I always thought that people had to be told something. I was never able to talk to Hubert Humphrey about it, but I was wondering who told top leaders a story and when did they tell it? We got interested in that because of the messages to Air Force One. Uh, so, but that's the Mrs. Hoover story. I suspect she's deceased now. That was a, a lot of years ago, but, uh, and the last hope was that the House Committee might be able to shed some light on it. Uh, but there are things like that sitting around to be found, uh, which cry out for investigation, but as in this case, really would require professional investigation. I mean, and or intelligence, somebody that can get at records, things like that. Uh, what was her first name? Uh, her first uh, name was, uh, I think it was L-E, initials L-E, and I can't remember her actual name. I think it was, uh, I think it was actually Louisa or something like that. But I called her Mrs. Hoover and the FBI report just says Mrs. L-E Hoover. She's, her first name isn't given. But Love the fact that the last name is Hoover. I think that's coincidental, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think she had any connection. In fact, uh, it didn't give her any, uh, it didn't help her with the FBI. Hoover was running the FBI at the time they worked her over. You know, Hoover was running for cover. They had a real problem. They had all kinds of contact with Oswald beyond the fact that they paid him as a low level informant and they looked like shit. Plus the whole Mexico situation where all that stuff was a mess. They, the point is the feds knew all kinds of stuff about Oswald's movement very little of which was discussed in the Warren report. They, they spent more time on interviewing a woman who babysat for him you know, when he was a kid. Um, they spent, what, five pages on Jack Ruby's mother's delusion that she had a wishbone stuck in her throat. They published 112 pages of the writings of Revilo Pendleton Oliver. And by the way, Revilo was Oliver spelled backwards. Uh, professor of classics, University of Southern Illinois. They were in American Opinion, the Burt Society publication. The title of the series was Marksmanship in Dallas, M-A-R-X-manship in Dallas. And he said that Kennedy was killed by the communists because and he had three theories. One was that uh, it was a rift in the upper echelons of the Communist Party. It was an internal fight. 
The second was uh, that he wasn't turning America over to the communists fast enough, and he had failed to get the gun control through. And he said gun control is, of course, a plan to disarm the American public and make them easy targets for balubas and associated savages of the United States nations who are going to invade this country and butcher its white inhabitants. His third theory was that Kennedy was planning to turn American. And he concluded with, unfortunately, there's no evidence to support this notion that Kennedy was planning to turn American. It's 112 pages plus testimony. I mean, so anyway, but I do think that the Mexico stuff was very critical. Some of it was not Oswald. Um, and all of it set trails to Russia and to Cuba. And now none of that, none of that, thank God, was able to be used to start a war. But those were the kinds of things left uh, and, and the key to Oswald's movement out of the country. One of the things I found in the archives, by the way, were some issues about uh, Oswald traveling on a bus versus how he got to Mexico. There are whole bunches of unanswered questions about every step of the way. Uh, so, um, uh, there's, a, there's a question that's just come through from Scott. Um, it's asking about uh, Jada. Um, did, uh, did they ever come up in your research? There's information that she was getting out of Dallas in a hurry on the morning of the assassination. That's uh, the only, the only part, uh, the only one I've looked at in, in those terms was um, Rose Sharami in terms of foreknowledge or things like that. I, I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't know anything about uh, Jada. Okay. Okay, thank have you. Have you, uh, sorry to butt in, uh, since you mentioned Rose Sharami, have you read um, his son's, her son's book? I haven't read her son's book, but I ordered it. I just learned that it was there. Somebody, we were talking about it in this other group, and uh, people told me that uh, that uh, uh, this is a, a rose by many other names. That's right. That's yeah, right. yeah. There are a couple of books about her. It, oh, actually, it, no, sorry. The, forgive me, Gary. There are two books. One is called A Rose by Any Other Name, and the other one is by her son Mercadus, called um, uh, Rose Sharmi Gathering Fallen Petals. Yeah, that's a second. Right. Edition. Yeah, I've read. I've I've just finished uh, a rose by many other names. I I was a little disappointed. As interested as I am in Rose Sharami, and it has some interesting additional details. I it's not very well written, not so easy to follow. And um, I think we I went through what Garrison had on her, um, and. Uh, there's little doubt that she had some kind of knowledge of the characters. And I do think there's fair documentation that she mentioned it was going to happen beforehand. Um, I can't put all that together, however, uh, except uh, I do follow what Douglas says in JFK and the Unspeakable, that lots of trails were being laid uh, so that if people really started investigating or looking, they would go in a lot of different directions. Uh, Cuba, Russia, small conspiracies. And this is one of the issues with the Garrison investigation. Yeah. Um, I agree. I totally agree. I uh, tell you what, uh, this is the most difficult thing in this, of this whole enigma, is to stay focused on that one subject and do not get distracted by branching out to all these yeah. different things as such. I think a lot of people fell victim to this, in all honesty. Oh, it's not I, a criticism, I, I, it's very normal. No, I certainly have uh, many times. Uh, it's, it's partly for the very first time in my life, again, studying wildlife management and then eventually psychology, I'm looking at FBI reports, CIA reports. I'm going through document. I went through the longest two documents in the National Archives are the, um, uh, 1179 one and two had to be split into two files. These are threats against the president. You wouldn't believe. I mean, this guy had as many threats as, as Abe Lincoln did, who was lucky to make it to Washington to get inaugurated. I mean, it's really awesome. 
how much stuff is there. I've never seen things like that. I didn't know much about any of these agencies when I started. And so this is an endless learning experience about people, about the role of the agencies, about power, um, and also the degree to which ordinary people can end up being silent because they're scared shitless of the consequences. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things I think that some people found disappointing in my article about um, legacy of fear was that the biggest issue to me was lingering fear and threats and things like this that were documented. It wasn't the deaths alone. It was the fact that people had been threatened in many areas of the case, the killing of Tippett. Virtually everybody involved in that had had serious threats. There were areas of the case, uh, Ruby's presence at the Parkland Hospital. There's certain things where people were hounded and hounded to keep their mouth shut. And people are still now, or their kids are coming forward with old stories. I mean, that's the amazing thing. Sometimes a whole generation stayed silent, and but they told their kids, or they gave their kids something. And so that's why it's still possible to discover, you know, new things. Uh, in, in regard to Garrison, I mean, let me tell you what the the big disconnect right away for me. Uh, and I would tell you, I believe he was very sincere. He's a very bright man, uh, had a lot of talents, but uh, look, you, you had to connect anything that happened in Louisiana with what happened in Dallas, or you don't have a legal charge, okay? It's not just that people conspired, it's that the conspiracy led to something. That's a critical part of what the law requires. He linked it. See, I think Oswald's a big link, but not as a shooter. He linked it to Oswald. He didn't say Oswald was a shooter, but that he brought the weapon into the depository that morning. And I think, I don't believe there's any critic of the Warren report that believes that. Mm. That was one of the first things we shot down. And in fact, the commission struggled with because they had Buell Wesley Fraser on the stand and they tried every way to trick him into showing a length of a bag long enough to have contained the stock of that rifle. And he never came close. He said he carried it under his arm, into his armpit, you know, in the palm of his hand. Uh, can't be done with that weapon. Uh, it's too long. Everything, they made him estimate in the air and then they ran over and they measured. <laughs> and Fraser somehow kept very consistent. They were never able to show that there was anything other than curtain rods or some other item in there. So that, that, that is a necessary, if you can't prove that, you literally don't have a case. Number yeah. two, the, the meetings, in, in, the meetings in, in Clinton and so forth, if you take all of that at face value, that sounds like planting, planting leads, planting legends, planting stories about low level conspiracies. That, that's not, uh, none of that stuff was planning an assassination. Uh, in fact, there's a plot that was tape recorded in Miami that's got more planning than, than occurred in Clinton. Uh, so I, I, I mean, what I bought was that this big part of Oswald's life that the commission wasn't that interested in, namely New Orleans the summer before gets gets ignored and a whole lot is going on there, but I don't, links to creating a fake left-wing group, links to right-wing groups, uh, traveling in the anti-Castro-Cuban circles. But none of that takes me to the killing of Dallas other than that Oswald, I believe was a patsy. Yeah. And this was part of the patsy making. But Got that, it. that doesn't fly See, that's the start of the investigation. That doesn't take you, that doesn't connect you to Dallas in any way you're gonna be able to prove because you're gonna have to prove the conspiracy and how it worked and then put Oswald in as the scapegoat. And that wasn't, unfortunately, um, that the case wasn't built that way. Got so, it. Hi there, <laughs> um, just, a, just a quick question. Um, I've studied this case for quite a long time and, and the evidence in which uh, the other side try and 
uh, uh, used to charge that Oswald was guilty. Um, I, I don't think there is one provable aspect of their of their case. Uh, all the evidence that would be used against them, uh, it just doesn't have no. It has no verifiable basis. Um, I will say one thing. Um, I think uh, that Wesley Fraser was was perhaps threatened. Um, his gun that we know his gun was uh, confiscated to the, the British Enfield. Um, it was taken by the Dallas police and I think he was threatened. I, I, I think the whole um, curtain rod story is a figment of his imagination uh, to protect himself. I mean, only two people ever see Oswald with this package and that's uh, Fraser and his sister. No one else sees it. And I just, I just don't find that credible. If Oswald carried a package, more people would have seen it. And I certainly believe that uh, Oswald was eating his lunch during the assassination or before it or whatever. Uh, and where did he get his lunch from if he never carried it in with him that morning? So I, I think the curtain rod story has been, far, been accepted far too long. Uh, and it's a myth. I don't have any opinion at all, except that I don't think it's been demonstrated that he carried a package of sufficient size that was observed going in. There is, you know, an account that's uh, come out that Douglas talks about of actually somebody taking something to the depository a week earlier, um, mm. and which may or may not have been Oswald. But I think the bigger issue is that uh, the we know that there were two weapons observed in the hands of people in the sixth floor. One was a rifle with a telescopic sight, which you know, could be any number of rifles from the one that they found to the one that they, the, the Weitzman affidavit described, the man liquor Carcano to something else. And- Is it Mauser? Yeah, it could have, yeah, Mauser, yeah, it could have been anything. The people saw it from too far away, but it was a hunting rifle type thing with a scope. And then the man seen on the other end of the sixth floor, a short thick set man with a dark brown suit uh, had a shorter weapon uh, and the witnesses saw it, didn't know what it was, but it, they thought it was a weapon and thought it was the secret service actually up there. So, uh, but obviously people were seen on the sixth floor with what appeared to be weapons. And wasn't there a, wasn't there a, I remember reading this in one of Jim DiGenio's books, I can't remember what it was, that there was a, there was an envelope found and it said Mauser shell, and it was dated from, and it was said it was from Dealey Plaza, and it was dated from 11 63 but the envelope was empty. I can't remember, but it was definitely from Jim D. Eugenio that I, I got that from. Well, yeah, there was such a thing. I, I think what you've got is with the Dallas police and the Dallas Sheriff's Office, you have really sloppy, crappy work, and some of it is what you don't know is, did they screw up? Was something substituted? You got a lot of weird characters. You've got um, uh, a Dallas Postmaster who sits in on some of the interrogation has got some of the only notes. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff here. And Ruby, of course, was very, uh, very well tied to the police department, uh, had been for years. And was believed to know about half of the force on a first name basis. Whether that's true, I don't know, but. Um... Can I just interrupt really quickly uh, regarding the notes that you're mentioning, the notes are from postal inspector, Harry Dean Holmes. He was on his way to church on Sunday morning and then basically thought, I think I'll just go and check what Will Fritz is doing, just by sheer coincidence. <laughs> Went in there and basically got there and then Will Fritz said, hey, Harry, do you want to join in on this interrogation as such? And of course, yes, of course I'd like to join in. Now, Dean Holmes didn't take any notes, but he had a very good re recollection. He had an amazing recollection. If you read Larry Sneed's book, you almost piss your pants on basically saying that how people were convicted at that point, because all it would take was them people sitting there and have a detective sitting behind the suspect. And if they'd had to go to court, they just basically say whatever they wanted to say to get that guy convicted because nothing was recorded by a notes, handwriting, and so forth. Will Fritz's notes, which were sent to the ARB by anonymous donor in 1996 on contemporary notes, 
the suspicion falls on that he took them from James Bookout. James Bookout was the was the li liaison between the FBI and the Dallas police, who was there before Oswald was dropped off inside um, DPD. And then, of course, you've got James Book um, James Hosty. Hosty did take notes during the first interrogation. Fritz didn't. Book out, we don't know if he took notes, nor do we know that Tom Kelly took notes of the Secret Service, nor do we know, what's his name, uh, Robert Irvin Nash of the Marshals, which I'm still looking for, did notes. But what we do know is that Book out and Hosty did a joint report of the first interrogation, which Book out changed two days later, because Hosty got chucked out of the building, basically, because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. And, and pissed Hoover off and everybody else in the, in the high command. And we know that Tom Kelly and Bookhout made for every interrogation practically a typed up report. Back then, it was standard procedure for an FBI agent to take notes and then afterwards type a report. And when, once that report was typed out, the notes were supposed to disappear, basically being tossed in, about, in the wastebasket as such. The thing is, is that Hosty back then said he didn't keep his notes, but when his book came out, by miracle, part of his notes start to appear. These are his notebook notes. What I found in two years ago in Malcolm Blunt's archive was a sheet of Dallas affidavit paper where he basically wrote his first draft of a report that he basically discussed um, what Oswald had said at that point. Wow. Now, to keep a long story short, that overall, a lot of people said they took notes, they destroyed the notes, this, that, and the other. O over the last five years, I've been investigating basically the interrogations of Oswald. And it basically sh shows that quite a few people had actually reports made up or had notes as such, but put them, swept them under the rug, especially James Hosty had, um, there are two sets of notes and they basically were swept underneath the rug and only appeared shortly before and after his death as such. I'm sorry to interrupt. But no, that's, I'm glad you interrupted. That's fascinating. Uh, terrific that you've put that stuff together. It's also a, a good illustration of the fact that the case isn't dead, that you- there, Oh, there anything are things, but, I mean- yeah, but, There are things that, that still are discoverable. Yeah. I've got to thank Malcolm Blunt for that because Malcolm Blunt basically found all the missing, a lot of missing pieces of the puzzle as such, because he's been so tenacious in uh, obtaining the records uh, from NARA and other archives, be it in Miami or in Tennessee or in Dallas as such. So, but you know, but that's what you, that's what you get when you spend a good 25 years in uh, obtaining that stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah. You know, but it, it is amazing it, it, that to me, you know, because all of these are things that would have been very helpful to know back then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, obviously, if there had been a real investigation rather than a cover up plus dozens of cover ups around the cover up, uh, you know, we actually would have known, probably figured out who the hell were the key players, at least in the planning and so forth. I'm sure the shooters are long gone. They were never interested. All they had was Oswald. And once Oswald was shot to death, that was it. It was case closed. The Dallas yeah. police were never interested in who killed the president. And they didn't actually care uh, who, who did yeah. it or not. Uh, a few of the officers have made derogatory remarks. Remarks regarding President Kennedy, uh, Jim Lavelle being one of them. Uh, they didn't care. They had Oswald. He was dead. And as far as I'm concerned, the Dallas police are culpable for his murder. So... Well, no, no question that uh, in that part of the country, the anti-Kennedy feeling was pretty strong. Uh, and quite clearly in the struggle going on with the Cold War and nuclear uh, proliferation uh, that uh, some fairly key generals, key, key players at the head of US military viewed Kennedy as, as, an, as a traitor. Uh, whether or not they knew about his private interaction with Nikita Khrushchev and the fact that the two leaders had each talked to the other about having trouble with warmongers in their own military, uh, the, the reality was that it, it's gotten easy now with so much that's come out to see 
how they could have decided he was a traitor and needed to be removed, period. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, got a, I'm a, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Johnny. No, just a quick question. I've asked a lot of people this question and they don't know the answer to it. Did Robert Kennedy ever visit Dealey Plaza or did he ever go to Dallas? I've asked so many people that and they don't know. Um, it was believed that, that he had people do it and report to him. Jones Harris has said that and, and uh, Solandry and others believe that Jones Harris may at times have been in some way working as an investigator for RFK. The, the general belief of people I know has been that he didn't go himself, he didn't look himself, but that there were, he was concerned, interested, and in fact, had people look into certain elements of the case. Um, you know, there was a period of time when one of the, one of the people that was a suspect was actually RFK because uh, they were putting out the legend that he was um, uh, that it was a spinoff from one of his anti Castro things that had caused people to go after his brother and that he was in, you know, in effect, he had he had stirred the pot that had led to it and stuff. So there, there were actually was an attempt to imply that there was a link of that sword. That's other, written about in Mahoney's sons and brothers. Oh, I, that's one I haven't, haven't read. Yeah, from 1999, um, um, that uh, he, Bobby Kennedy thought that um, it was Cuban elements involved that he'd been working with and uh, when Mongoose was dropped, that they uh, turned the assassination team around. It's an interesting book. It's a good book. I've just finished reading it, actually. I haven't read it, but I've, I've heard that, that idea presented before. Uh, RFK Jr.'s book, uh, American Values, um, which came out uh, last year, which is an interesting book about with a lot of family stuff in it, uh, doesn't go into anything much about the assassination. It comes up, but whatever was going on with his father or others, it wasn't something he was privy to, but it was interesting because as I read the book and got a lot of information about uh, JFK and the family and those issues, I, I, I had hoped for more about that, but it's, it's not a feature item in the book. Although the rest of the book reveals a whole lot of stuff that was going on in the family and concerns and questions and so forth, but that isn't one of them. You know, it's quite funny. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been saying for quite a number of years now that his uncle and father were killed as a result of a conspiracy. And I was on uh, Wikipedia last night. I was, I was looking up something to do with Robert Kennedy and I clicked on R.F. Kennedy Jr.'s page and on the top line it says, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., conspiracy theorist. If you go on his Wikipedia page, that's what labels him as a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Pretty incredible. Yeah, although uh, he got he got that uh, he got that for things about vaccines and and that stuff. I don't think, ironically, he was called that until he started weighing in on vaccines and the virus and stuff. That, that I I don't think I I I don't know for sure, but that's the first time I've heard of him referred to as a conspiracy theorist was when there were all these disputes going about the virus and vaccinations and so forth. He's very you think, you think surely, though, that a member of the Kennedy family coming out and said, yeah, my uncle and my father were both killed as a result of conspiracy, that this would uh, make headlines somewhere. But uh, well, it doesn't. Well, you're right. You're right. And, and even I would say that in America, the number of people that know about the Kennedy Khrushchev link, you know, is like one percent. Very few people know about it. I, I know some fairly well-read people where I, I will mention that and they'll look, I get a blank stare back. By the way, um, not just that, one of more interesting things was that this, have you folks seen the film Official Secrets? It's about a, a British case of a gal who's 
basically decided she had to breach the Official Secrets Act and talk yeah, about it. Kira Knightley. Yeah. It's a I I thought the film was very good, but what fascinated me was it's a story I didn't know. I read a lot. I had never seen that story before. I didn't know about it. I guess it was front page stuff in in your country, but it the interesting thing is that we wouldn't hear it. And of course it had to do with covering up the fact that Tony Blair was uh, helping, um, you know, basically helping Bush create a bit of a myth. I, I am fascinated that I do not believe that got reported over here. And yet it was a major issue, I know, in the UK, because I then researched it, looked at it and thought, wow, isn't that amazing that I don't know about it, that I didn't know about it until I saw this film. Great film, though. I, I love the film. It really portrays yeah, it the challenges of following your conscience when you got a law that says you got to keep your mouth shut. And yet, as she said, uh, there's this great point where they said, well, the, the prosecutor takes her through this line of questioning about, well, you are employed by the British oh. government and so forth. And you took it. So she said, she said, no, I'm employed by the British people. And they dropped the charges against her partly because in taking that position, what she was saying is, no, I, I work for the people, not the government. It was it's a very striking kind of point of view in terms of saying what's important. Is, is, is it protecting people being right or is it doing somebody's dirty laundry? There's a film that's very similar to that. It's called The Report. Which yes. came out a couple of years ago, which is in a similar vein, same kind of oh, I love, I love that. Going. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, those two are two of my favorite films in terms of showing the moral struggle and dilemma. Yeah. And also how hard it is to fight against omnipresent fear, omnipresent threat. And we Got know it. in the Kennedy case, there are some people passed and some people didn't. I'm not, I don't stand in judgment of the people that, you know, basically uh, gave, you know, gave in. I, I personally, you know, got uninvolved in the case to some degree after what happened to Jim Murray. I, I just, there was a point in time, I just thought this is, this is getting too hot. For and Johnny, I, I know you've got a question. I'll, I will bring you in here, but there's something that um, yeah, yeah. Gary has mentioned that I just, I'm, I'm just trying to, so Gary um, Severin has mentioned that I just want to just put to you very briefly. Uh, and and must say, Gary, you've gone on a long time for me. Thank you so much. It's been a terrific afternoon. You usually get a talk for about an hour and we're down for like an hour and a half. So I hope you're okay to continue for a little bit. And Gary's question is just about um, your talk with Paul Rothme Rothmel. Sorry, Paul Rothmel. Um, did you want to talk about your, your talk with Paul Rothmel? Well, this was a, uh, an opening that Hal Weisberg created and I got involved with. Uh, Paul Rothermel was the chief of security for H.L. Hunt. H.L. Hunt at the time of the assassination was second richest man in the world. And he was a suspect in the early days where people were thinking Texas oil millionaires did it. And there were books out saying that, some of the early books. So, um, but we got interested uh, partly because we didn't think that this was about Texas oil millionaires. And uh, we started interchanging with, with Paul Rothermel. They had all kinds of sources. They could get us stuff that we couldn't get other places. And, and um, he, he made a comment one time. He said, one of the reasons this HL Hunt wouldn't have done it was he's too cheap. <laughs> He wouldn't have spent the money. Yeah, this guy takes, he's the richest man in the world. He takes his lunch in a paper bag. And if he really likes you, he'll, he'll like give you the apple. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, what happened was that uh, they, were, they were very interested in two things. They were interested, obviously, in anybody saying Hunt did it, but they were also interested in learning about right wing groups. He was known as a cheapskate. Who, despite his wealth, would was a conservative as hell, but wouldn't do much funding for right-wing groups. And if you could show him that a right-wing group had some violent elements to it, Rothermel told us that he, you know, he was very interested in that because Hunt was 
fearful of revolutions and killing and stuff. And if anybody was violent or had a violent part of their group, they, he would not want to go near it. So we started trading information on some of the Cuban groups uh, with them. Um, and what they were telling us, what Rothermel was telling us was that uh, uh, that, would, that could prevent any funding from going to those groups, which if it's true, we <laughs> felt pretty good about. Uh, but uh, so, uh, and the collaboration around this whole David Croman thing, who he was, what was he doing investigating? Who did he represent? Uh, he was also very interested. They were very interested in who the hell he was. There are, by the way, two people going under the name Don Morgan in the case, and uh, Croman's only one of them. Uh, Gary, um, I probably told you that, I don't know, it was back in 2005 or so, I got a hold of Rothermel. And we had about three phone conversations. The fourth one, his wife answered and he had fallen off the roof cleaning his satellite dish and broke his neck. But <laughs> yeah, she said he shouldn't have been up there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the first during the first three conversations, <clears throat> I was pretty explicit in terms of what I thought. And he'd listen. And finally, when I got too explicit, one day he said, when call the third call he said uh, I don't like where this conversation is going and um, people in Texas made too many mistakes Kennedy made too many mistakes and I'm taking it to the grave with me huh did he ever go there I, with you no you actually have had a far more recent conversation than any of mine mine are from the 1970s and I, I don't think I ever felt I, nor did Hal Weisberg think that we knew what made him tick. What we did know is that he got us some information that was valid and helpful. And they had all kinds of ways to get inside government stuff. Uh, they, had, they had their own intelligence agency, um, but um, never knew where he stood personally. Obviously a chief of security for a a conservative to right wing wealthy person is not likely to be too sympathetic to going too far with an assassination inquiry unless they think the commies did it. Right. So uh, it's, I, it's one of those. I, I was troubled that, you know, not the only person to fall off a roof, but you're thinking uh, Rothermel's got to be fairly well off and going up and adjusting the. Uh, thing on the roof would you would think he would hire somebody to do that he wasn't a young man at the time but yeah. again i've had some pretty smart people fall off roofs and really survive so <laughs> didn't know what to make of it yeah. you you just mentioned uh Harold weisberg can you tell us more about your interactions with him i mean to me he's the god of all documentations i mean malcolm is a great second but um you know, the oh. guy who originally kicked it all off uh, for the hunt for documentation and so forth, uh, you know, and people using his material without accrediting him and stealing documentation from him and so forth. Um, well, know, there, yeah, it was unfortunate because uh, that that was an ongoing issue. You know, when I would go to the National Archives, by the way, I would make copies of stuff and I would for anybody who would just pay me to make a Xerox, I'd send them. So I'd been doing that for years. Well, it turned out Lifton was getting them and then selling, reselling them to people like Mary Farrell. And when I first met Mary, we discovered that Lifton had neatly left out the most important stuff that I had found. But there was always this tension going. Uh, Hal had devoted his life to it. So that was problematic. It meant he was to remain poor and, you know, and at times angry about people who had more money and wishing that people would kick in money and so forth. Um, he um, was a, a day and night researcher. His place was just filled with stuff. His, the archives, I know, the, of all of his stuff has got an incredible amount of stuff in it. But just our interchanges, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of letters. And what he would do is he used a kind of very thin onion skin kind of sheet. So 
and when he wasn't using them for carbon copies, he would he would type on them. So some of these things were were pretty hard to read. But Hal and I worked on a great many things together. I did some of the archives work, where again he would tell me the things he wanted me to look at. Now he typically made very smart choices. I would never in a million years have thought to go for the administrative files, but that's where there was a lot of gold. Uh, because the lawyers would write memos about things that were confidential and kept secret afterwards. People didn't think to look at what was there in their notes and memos. There, was, there were even people arguing against uh, or for conspiracy against lone gun. I mean, it was incredible stuff. But um, he, um, Hal Weisberg, a uh, number of interesting things. He lived in a, a small house in, in uh, uh, Frederick. Frederick, Maryland. And uh, uh, he, uh, his wife, by the way, made the best fried chicken I've ever had. <laughs> but he, 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 a lot of young people like myself, young men who were investigators, he ended up interacting a lot with them and working with them. He, he sort of shepherded a bunch of us into learning about this. He was a Senate investigator years ago, and he had had the job of helping cover up um, the stuff about Forrestal. And I think the stuff about the attempt on, on, on um, FDR's life, the, the plot to kill him. And, and so he had some knowledge and awareness of sort of cover-ups. That's not in any of his books. It's not something he talk, talked about in general so people didn't realize it. Um, but he... Um, uh, he did a lot of work in New Orleans. He was on the ground there quite a bit and um, interacted with a lot of the characters. He was the main person from whom I was learning about the people who were playing a role down there. Um, and he did push Garrison in a lot of right directions like around David Furry and other things. Um, but um, the... Uh, you know, how also though, although he had a lot of these good collaborative relationships with younger investigators like myself, they tended to be friction with, uh, he and Vince Salandria didn't get along particularly well and uh, left in many others. So uh, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so there were, there, the, this tension was there. Uh, he believed that Garrison had some pieces and there was some real potential there, but also felt that they were too easily going down blind pathways. Um, and uh, Hal is the source of some of my most interesting <laughs> stories and experiences. I'll give you one example. When I arrived in uh, New Orleans, um, it was a week after three of the Clinton witnesses had been thrown out of a balcony at the Fontainebleau and fortunately hit an umbrella or a, a, a going down and didn't get killed, but there had been some rough stuff. And when Harold checked into the Fontainebleau, apparently he had to go to the bathroom and he was aware there was some noise in his unit and through a crack in the bathroom door, he saw some Cuban guy planting a bug. I, I mean, and there was just all kinds of weird stuff. Well, anyway, one of the first things Hal did on that trip is he went to see Dean Adams Andrews. And Andrews knew a lot about happenings in New Orleans. He's an incredible character. It's not just that Clay Bertrand hiring a lawyer for Oswald. It's that he, he's a man about that. He knows a lot of things. Well, he had, when he was talking to, when he was talking to Andrews, just a couple mornings before, Andrews got a phone call from a client. And this client, in New Orleans, they all have nicknames. This client was called the, the Bulldog. And here's what, what Weisberg heard was something like, well, uh, man, I got trouble, man. The, the, the rat's going to hit me. And uh, Andrews says, well, where's the rat now? Well, the rat's in Baton Rouge. He said, well, they ain't, they ain't hitting by Western Union. When he comes to town, you drop me a nickel and you uh, let me know and we'll take care of him. So here I am three days later having breakfast with Harold and, and we open this Times Picayune front page headline. This guy, the bulldog has fingered the rat for an unsolved Mardi Gras murder. 
and the rats is in custody. <laughs> and Harold just laughed and laughed and then told me the story. He said, he said, that's the practice of law in, <laughs> in New Orleans. That's how we protect this client. They framed the guy for a murder. Uh, but anyway, uh, and that's the same breakfast where Boxley showed up. But um, uh, he, uh, he was dedicated to work on the case. Uh, he pounded away. He uh, found a lot of stuff and, and got a lot of the details, a lot of the pieces, and broke a lot of other stuff uh, loose. And um, it was always good to work with him because he did stay on track. And uh, again, as I said, there were times where what we found at the National Archives was as much a result of him directing us in a proper way. Hal Verb on the West Coast, who's now deceased, was also part of that crew. And Hal and I went to the archives together and worked as a team. Uh, but again, Harold was always a key person in the background for whom we were collecting a lot of the data. And uh, Harold, Harold Rothman, you may know from the, his book, there are a number of people that started with, uh, with Hal Weisberg. So, um, yeah. See, um, Andrews, Andrews told Harold Weisberg that Shaw was Bertrand. Is that correct? I don't remember specifically how he learned that, but yes, how did he did learn that that Shaw was Bertrand and Harold was one of the early uh, people to find that out. And Andrews was receiving death threats as well. Yes. Yeah. With Andrews, though, you never know what's going on. He's an incredible character. I'm sure he was getting death threats, but he's in the middle of all kinds of deals. He's quite a character. In fact, uh, he's a lot like John. If you saw the movie, Jeff K, John, yeah. John Candy plays Bertrand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but i give you another example, though. Um, how I'd gotten Hal Weisberg up here to give a presentation. And we went on a new talk radio show, 24 hour talk radio. We were supposed to be on for two hours. Well, we suddenly drew this enormous audience. We kept going for 20 hours <laughs> and wow. it was unreal. And it, we made the station, that station used to have just crackpots calling in. Now they were having judges, lawyers, doctors, all kinds of people calling in and the entire audience for that station changed over that period of time. It was unbelievable because it's a station I would never have tuned into before, but then became a place that people discuss things like this. Well, among the things that showed up, get this, this is during the show in Minneapolis, pretty far away from Los Angeles, or New Orleans or Dallas. We had a guy um, who called um, who had served under General Edwin Walker in Germany, but that then had rebelled against the right wing stuff and become a pacifist and actually had to eventually leave the military because he'd become a pacifist. He had been in New Orleans on a family trip and happened to film Lee Harvey Oswald and around that street incident, which is what you know was to happen. But he has film footage of Oswald walking down the street and somebody on the other side, when you slow it down, who appears to be signaling. And Dean Andrews had told Weisberg that there were observers there. There was somebody else there in that whole incident that ended up with the fight with Carlos Bringuer. And right at that, <laughs> we're watching this film that another guy who called in, who's a photo expert, helped us make copies of and slow down and print out. And we're seeing uh, and a big fat guy walks right past the camera and blocks it out. And Hal said, that's Dean Andrews. And I said, well, we don't know. It's a guy of his size though. <laughs> but, but we wondered if he was actually there. And when Hal asked him, he was nonplus. He just said there were people there. So, uh, but it does appear to us that there was somebody shadowing Oswald who was signaling from the other side of the street. Certainly those whole, those incidents were a very important part of the trail he was leaving. Uh, but in any event, that, that guy showed up. And by the way, the FBI, he sent his film to the FBI, another film that no one had ever heard of. His name is John Martin, but it's a different John Martin that has the, than the other film. This guy 
also had film of General Edward Walker's house in the back. Uh, it was kind of amazing. Um, and uh, I mean, again, this out of the blue calling the radio station. Um, but um, John Martin, when we looked at his film, the FBI had never sent him back his original. They sent him back a copy, they lied. And he had a receipt to show that they said they were returning the original. Uh, and he believed there was some footage missing, but not sure, a little bit like Orville Nix, who just felt that it wasn't, it wasn't the whole film, no way to prove it. Uh, but that's an example of something, our long thing and how Weisberg in particular brought that guy out of the woodwork. And uh, there were things like that that would happen all the time um, where, you know, his talk would stimulate that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, I for, unfortunately lost some largely lost contact over the years when I got inactive. And of course he stayed working to the day he died. Uh, did, did they ever meet Mark Lynn? Oh, yes. Work. Yeah, I, I didn't meet him in Ithaca when he spoke, uh, which got me into the case, but I, uh, he came to Minneapolis um, later, I uh, helped set up a talk and we went on a radio show together and then uh, Mark and I were in touch very, very sporadically. Uh, um, but uh, we were followed after the radio show and um, the guy later approached me to find out who I was and so forth. Uh, it, it was an interesting thing, but Mark, uh, Mark had a lot to do with many people getting into the case. Mark's who convinced me that there was something afoot and his talks at coffee houses and on campuses in the early days were very key. You could not get on an American radio or TV show. And my, my series in early 19, uh, 67 in the Minneapolis Star Tribune is the first time any newspaper of any note had allowed a critic to write anything. And I, obviously I'm small potatoes, so I wasn't f famous. I didn't have a book or anything, but Mark was very key in those early days and um, uh, really had a lot to do with people's involvement. But he was involved, he got involved in so many different causes, the Jonestown thing. He got involved in so many different events and political stuff. I was involved uh, the Wounded Knee trial in uh, Minneapolis. He was part of the team along with Kunstler and the other attorneys. I helped with some of the jury selection research. But uh, so I, I ran into him in a couple different lives and contexts to not necessarily the case. Okay. And of course, okay. later on, he wrote uh, A Citizen's Descent and then uh, a couple of other books. And I guess there's one last book that I haven't read, but I just learned there's a, a final book he wrote uh, not long before he died. Yeah, it's called The Last Word. Oh, The Last yeah. Word. Okay, I just learned of that. Yeah. Has anybody read it? I, I'm I have. Yeah, I have. And in, in that, in, in that, I think it is in Last Word. He talks about um, being confronted by someone who was apparently paid to kill him. And the guy says he couldn't do it and, and, and walked away or something. That's in his book. I read that oh. in Last Word. Well, so, yeah. er, he, early in the game, he used to get, he was nabbed a couple times by FBI agents. Uh, that's where we learned an interesting trick. Um, if the FBI suddenly showed up to hassle you, right after a phone call or several phone calls, you would think back, what was it I just talked about on the phone? And that's where we figured out that the double Oswald incidents were important. It was after a call about that, that the FBI jumped him in downtown Manhattan and said he had stolen government files. And it was after phone calling about this double Oswald incident, which nobody took seriously at first. We thought it was just people making mistake in identification. <laughs> and that's when that whole area of inquiry got more serious because that was obviously what had brought the FBI to his door out of the blue. So that became a game of <laughs> throwing things out to see if you got any response. Gary, any talk oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, can you, sorry to interrupt. Um, Tony, go ahead. 
No, no, go ahead, mate. Oh, I, right, I just mean? wanted to ask you, because you've already spoke to us about Mark Lane and um, Harold Weisberg and uh, a few others, but one person is definitely missing, which is Vincent Salandria, who recently died. Do um, you mind telling us a bit more about him and your interactions and... Uh, have you been in contact with him shortly before he passed away or was it all like back in the yes. 60s? Oh yeah, no, I've been, Vince and I've been part, there's a discussion group called Arigato that has been going for about four years that has very much focused on Vince's network and I was part of it. So I've been regular contact with Vince for a while now, uh, which was welcomed. Um, Vince got divorced from his first wife who I really liked and it was unfortunate. His son had a drug problem. Vince thought he needed to force treatment, didn't. Then the son killed somebody. Vince had the terrible challenge as a dad that he's an officer of the court and he had to turn his own son in. Uh, the son went through a prison term, got treatment, came out, improved. It actually helped him. He then ran a coffee shop and stuff. But as a result, Vince remarried and his new wife, uh, this is like for 20 years or more, unfortunately hates the case. And he couldn't, he couldn't, so only a few people were able to get together with him face to face after that. We talked on the phone, we, we emailed, but so he went into this funny kind of thing where he was communicating around that, but only a couple of people actually were getting together with him regularly. So I would go back to Philadelphia and Vince would finally say, look, I, I, you know, my wife is, you know, hard to deal with around this stuff. So it, it created a weird situation, but Vince from the beginning had always looked at the big picture, looked at the issue of high level involvement. Uh, Harold Weisberg used to think he was paranoid and then and then started agreeing with the stuff um, and uh, realizing there was something to it. But um, Vince got very interested in um, the high level direction and cover up. And that's where we focused in on that issue of the messages to Air Force One. Air Force One lasted, landed in Washington, DC 458 Dallas time. Okay, so that would be, uh, it's an hour later in DC. But during that flight, we knew from T.H. White's making of a president, 1964, White wrote and later confirmed to us that in fact, a message had been received on the plane. The message was to LBJ, the new president, the Secret Service, that who needed to know the truth. They needed to know the worst version. The public could be told anything, but these are the people whose job it is to keep this guy alive. He's now the president of the United States. And they were told Oswald had been apprehended. There was no conspiracy, it was a lone assassin. Even days later, the Voice of America was still broadcasting things about assassins in the plural and people running up the grassy knoll. And a week later, uh, Dean Rusk was chided by Gerald Ford for saying there was no conspiracy, saying it's too early to tell. But this message was sent. And the question is, who sent it? And what exactly was the text? Now, bear in mind, at five o'clock Dallas time, Oswald hadn't been charged with shit. No. Not, not even until, the murder. Not until, not until 10 past seven. Right. And I've got to tell you one thing, and this is a document that I found, which is from Clyde Tolson where Nicholas Katzenbach at 10 past four, so that's 10 past three Dallas time, basically wants to declare Oswald as the guilty man as such. That is an hour, that's an hour and 20 minutes after his arrest. Now that was Katzenbach, was that Katzenbach that wanted to do that or? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's in a document uh, with Clyde Tolson and um, that, uh, I found that in Malcolm's archive as well uh, a few months ago. And, um, holy moly. Because there's a, uh, docu a documentary uh, around when the JFK film came out, then a lot of people said like, there was a fragment where um, Nicholas Katzenbach says within a week after the assassination, like that Oswald is the guilty one and needs to be sorted out. And everybody was like in quiet, feathers were ruffled about that. 
and they thought, oh, a week. And then on the day that the assassination documents were released in 2017, I found a document from Hoover where Hoover is actually spoon feeding the text to Katzenberg on the 25th. So I thought, ah, it wasn't the 27th, it was already on the 25th. And then I find this document written by Tolson and Tolson says to some of the FBI head on show and said, yeah, I spoke to Katzenberg at 10 past four and he already wants to put something out and declare Oswald the guilty man, but we're going to wait, blah, 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 etc., etc. It almost reeks like a cover your ass document, like, oh, and if it does come out, then Katzenberg gets the blame because he already did it so quickly. But the timing of it was just amazing because that... Will Fritz was still interrogating <clears throat> Oswald for the very oh, first yeah. time. Well, well, what he was didn't it? quit until four o'clock in the afternoon, the first interrogation quit. So... Well, and that it, that it, the rifle wasn't linked to his box till two a.m. the next morning, uh, and uh, what was it? Seven twenty-six. He was ushered between rooms, and somebody said, "You killed the president." He said, "I haven't been asked about that." They're asking me about the killing of a police officer. No, that was around uh, just after midnight uh, on the twenty-third. Okay, all that stuff is going on. Uh, well, that's a very important thing. That's a piece we didn't have, regardless of whether it's faked. Or what it is, the, the point is that's anything that day is mind boggling. What, the by the way, the we people. don't know who sent the message. Uh, 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 they confirmed that Major Harold R. Patterson, codenamed Stranger, was in charge of the Situation Room and monitor and sending messages, but there were two possible sources. One is the CIA, which had that link. The other was the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the US military were meeting at the time of the assassination and then just kept meeting. So those were the two groups that could have sent a message to Air Force One. Now the other piece to this, oh, and by the way, Salinger uh, offered to let Vince get access to his personal file in the National Archives where his copy of the tape, and when the archivist went looking for it, it was gone. Of course. <laughs> By the way, the very first document I sought in the National Archives was gone and has never been found. The first document I wanted to see, and you'll all figure out why in just a second, was a file of photos of Lee Harvey Oswald. Because he looks different in different photos. And if I was going to ask vit witnesses, this guy you saw, I wanted to know which kind of facial image. And, and, and I, I don't I'm not even saying those are not all Oswald. We all of us look different. I look at photos of myself taken by different cameras at different times and different settings. And my appearance changes quite a bit. So, but I just wanted to know which of the Oswald images are you saying you thought you saw? It was gone. It was gone right away. That was one of the first documents I saw. The archivist of the United States, actually, Robert H. Bamer was from Minneapolis. So I contacted him. He said, no, we can't find it. But anyway, uh, that's wild that um, uh, so we couldn't get access to the tape. Uh, so we're back to the fact that uh, at a time when it was not even known if Oswald was connected to the thing for sure, and certainly couldn't rule out a conspiracy or a plot, uh, people were being told that version. And um, in fact, Vince's letter to Pierre Salinger ended with, uh, out of respect for something John Kennedy gave his life for, would you give access? And Salinger said yes. But so that that particular piece, there are now versions of the tape out there. God only knows if anybody has a complete tape or what's out there if it's been altered. But we did think it was very critical to know where that message supposedly came from. Because anything like that, you'd have to be in on it. Gary, uh, I may have told you this 20 years ago, but I have a six hour uh, recording with a woman who was on the plane. And uh, she, I haven't listened to the tape, I haven't transcribed it, but she said that the message came across to everybody on the plane that Kennedy had been killed. She said the plane turned around to head back to Honolulu. Um, oh, you're talking about the ca the cabinet plane. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
was that isn't that what you were talking about initially? No, no, that's the that I'm talking about Air Force One heading to oh, DC from but, Dallas. Yeah, but yeah. you're right, the cabinet plane is a key piece of this because at the time these guys were up in the air, we know that the cabinet plane was heading to Tokyo, mid Pacific, had to turn around and come back. The cabinet plane, by the way, had most members of the cabinet in it, right? Uh, it was unusual that uh, it was very, very. Uh, and it was unprotected. It had no escort. And Dean Rusk, the ranking cabinet officer, went to the safe to get the code book because they needed to switch missing. to. Code book was missing. It wasn't there. That's this is the kind of thing book. you see in all the movies. They go and get the code book. He went to the safe to get the code. So they talked on open channel. That means that a ham radio operator possibly could have even listened in. So at this point, if someone is worried about how this is going to play out and whether people are buying a story, they could listen to the cabinet. They could listen to the Secretary of State. They could listen to LBJ and the Secret Service and see how's the story flying. Yeah. It's an extraordinary Here. breach of, uh, of Here's security. A a, a twist. I didn't recall, though, you had that interview. Uh, yeah, she was married to the Life magazine editor who was the master compositor for Life magazine and micromanaged 600 issues of Life. He was on the plane. Wow. And had the, had the picture in his possession of, you know, the backyard photo. And Rankin had to beg him four times in spring of 64 to give him the original picture. And finally, Ed Thompson, married to Lee Eitengong that I interviewed for six hours said, well, you know, I touched it up a little bit around the leg and around the rifle butt and around the shoulder. I mean, it was a limited hangout. It, it was like he admitted to touching up about five spots. But it's curious that he was hired away from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in about 1939. The reason I know this is because he went to the University of North Dakota. He was a child. Ah, okay. I knew there's going to be a North, yeah. North Dakota link here somewhere. <laughs> he, was, he was a child prodigy and Luce hired him because of his photo analysis expertise. It was going to be, life was going to be a picture magazine. Wow. And he could, he had perfected compositing photos newspapers so that you couldn't see the cut lines so when oswald says that's my head on somebody's body it's kind of curious plus he was on the plane rusk was grooming him to be the ambassador to the greek junta really he was an admitted fascist as loose was their offices were next to each other and i read his autobiography where he talked about his his fascism and his wife, the woman on the plane, was a Marxist. Wow. His family had, had Trotsky assassinated. <laughs> what, a, what a fascinating uh, piece. You know, the Life magazine, December 10th, 1964 issue, is still the best convincer for journalists or skeptics. I used to have, there were five versions, but three major differences. I used to have them side by side, and unfortunately, I loaned loaned out a couple and don't have the whole thing. But I have slides comparing them, and I had very hostile journalists who totally flipped on the case the second they saw that stuff. But basically, Life put out their big issue where they showed the Zap Bruder film for the first time, why, why the crime was committed. You know, Gerald Ford wrote the piece, how the commission reached its conclusions. This was a big deal. The problem was it showed the head snapping back and somebody had to have called loose because you're talking about a multi-million dollar decision that's about to happen. So a bunch of subscribers got the original version, which, and then it got stopped. The, the photos were changed. It wasn't that it were doctored, they substituted, um, 313, the explosion of the head, they had to, because there was no other way to show the headshot. But it, then they, they thereby concealed the, the movement backward. In fact, Ford claimed that 
that this was how the commission knew the direction from which the shots came, which is bullshit. But anyway, there were other changes made in the text, but they broke the plates, changed this story. They paid over a million dollars for and been working on for all that time. They changed it. And there are in existence three versions. And, and I think it was Paul Hoke wrote the uh, article entitled In the Midst of Death We Are in Life. Uh, but obviously loose, it had to be at a fairly high level. Somebody had to have influence with loose to make that call. Because I, I, you know, furthermore, it, it, it put them in a gun site if people discovered that but they had only sent, I don't know how many thousands they sent out, but it was subscribers that got some by mail before they were able to stop. They pulled them back from stores and everything and replaced them. Right. Millions got it. <clears throat> just a quick one before I leave. It's uh, just a quick question. Um, had he became president, uh, would, Robert, uh, would Robert Kennedy have uh, went after the people that killed his brother? Um, a lot of a lot of speculation about that. I believe he, he would have done something. What he would have done, I don't know. Um, it's tricky business um, if you're trying to be a politician to run a country and so forth. It it, it would have been a very tricky business. But I, I think we all believed he would he would do some things. He'd at least go hunting through the stuff. What we didn't know is whether the truth would ever come out through Robert Kennedy. That I was not convinced of. I think he would have done something because he loved his brother quite. He loved his brother a lot, and he, according to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., his father thought that the Warren Commission and the Warren Report was a shoddy piece of craftsmanship. So Robert Kennedy didn't believe it. Oh, I and I think he would have done something. Or what could be done behind the scenes? What I don't know is if he would have exposed it all. Uh, and or, you know, for example, uh, anybody have the guts to say that General Curtis LeMay or certain military people had this thing done? I mean, start thinking about what we're talking about. If we're talking about who's going to say, what does it take to get up and say that an agency of the government that has immense power and a huge budget and almost no oversight might have played a role or what about the FBI? I mean, I, you think the disputes over Trump's corruption and stuff is something, this would have dwarfed that a thousand times over. So the question would be, uh, was this a truth that, that anybody in leadership was ever gonna tell? And I don't know, I mean, it's speculative. He loved his brother, I'm sure he was outraged. I'm sure he would want to do something about it, but, uh, wanting to do something and feeling something in your heart is a lot different than practical reality of actually doing it. And I've always thought, I've, I've always held the belief that one of the reasons he, he was killed was obviously to stop him investigating his brother's death because I think it was probably assuming that he would have won the presidency. Um, but I've always believed that one of the reasons he wanted to become president was to find out what happened to his brother. Well, and I'm not disagreeing with you on that notion, but what I'm saying is I would think that the more likely scenario would be not that he would expose it, but that he would go after inside the people involved to the degree they were still around and that that's where the, the, you would have people like General Curtis LeMay retiring, you would, you would be getting rid of people. I mean, LeMay was, Barry Goldwater's uh, vice presidential partner. So he was still around functioning quite well through the 70s into the 80s. There are some key players that are fairly likely to have played a role that were still in powerful positions. Alan Dulles, uh, you know, I mean, and again, the question would be what actions would he take? I don't believe he could expose the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I just, I, I just thought I'd ask the question because it's something that I thought that he would have done as well behind the scenes. Yeah, he would have went after the people that killed his brother. Well, they were. It's there's a lot of evidence that 
people were more afraid of him than they were of his brother in a sense that he was smart, he was aggressive, he was energetic. And in fact, uh, he was someone that uh, was a tough cookie to deal with. And remember, he's the one that gave the orders and ordered J. Edgar Hoover to raid the assassin training camps around New Orleans uh, with the some of the CIA groups, the Castro groups. Those were all raided the summer before the assassination under Bobby's orders. Lake In fact, Hal Weisberg had interviews with a number of the girlfriends of the guys that talked about how quickly, once they got the information, they got tipped off. They had to break down the camps and get moving before the, uh, it, it was tough. Bobby Kennedy doing that. Did Did Lemay, it? Was Lemay uh, the vice presidential candidate in 68 or George Wallace? I don't remember whether, I don't remember what George Wallace could have been. I, I can't remember who Wallace's uh, I think uh, it was LeMay. I think he ran, uh, LeMay was his running mate. It Whether could be, but he's, he definitely was a, he definitely was a presence and, and bombs away LeMay uh, was one of the people that believed that we should, we had a nuclear advantage, we should wipe out the Soviet Union with a big strike. I mean, that was something he, he's well known to have believed and have pushed and uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, one of the things that has emerged and Douglas covers it in his book and RFK Jr. covers it in his book, there were a couple instances where the Joint Chiefs were meeting in Kennedy's office and Kennedy left, but the taping system was still operating. And it, I don't know that it was done on purpose, but they got tapes of these bastards plotting about first stripe stuff and talking about stuff. Kennedy had left the meeting because it was turning his stomach. He, he could not believe that these people were talking about wiping out the Soviet Union. I mean, and we would only have 100,000 casualties or a million casualties. I mean, it's insanity. But if you're interested, that whole end of stuff, um, uh, the Douglas book goes into this in some detail. Also, there's a book, uh, the brothers about Alan and John Foster Dulles, who are other players. But the Douglas book goes into some detail about that whole history and some of the players and what we have recordings of them saying. Uh, so again, it's easy to see the motive. If you believed as they do, Kennedy was a clear and present danger. He was a traitor. I mean, I can see how that argument would fly in a group that believed that anybody that was middle of the road was a traitor. Remember, the United States started assassinating leaders and attacking moderates or anybody that was not violently anti-communist. You didn't have to be communist. You just had to be weak on communism. So Sukarno and lots of de death warrants were signed for that. So how do you have Kennedy talking behind the scenes with Khrushchev about their mutual problems with generals that want to blow up the world. The Jeff, 